The term flying saucer was first coined back in 1947. Businessman Kenneth Arnold, who made the first major UFO sighting of the post-war era, told reporters that the UFOs he saw near Tacoma floated across the sky like a saucer skipping across the water. The name stuck. There have been thousands of sightings since then, according to some. There have also been UFO crashes with the evidence supposedly hidden by the government. George Knapp checks out some of those claims tonight in part two of our series, UFOs, the best evidence. George. Mary Ruth and uh, Gary, we mentioned last night that there is a large body of information about UFOs. How much of this constitutes evidence is another matter altogether. In some cases, it does appear that various government officials have withheld information about UFOs from the public. In other cases, the waters have been muddied by the UFO researchers themselves. Tonight, we examine two of the most controversial incidents. Billy Meyer is a one-armed Swiss farmer with a sixth grade education, an unlikely choice to pull off the world's most sophisticated UFO hoax. Since 1975, Meyer says, he's been in contact with cosmonauts from the Pleiades star cluster. Meyer isn't the first to claim extraterrestrial visitations, but he is the first to document contact in such stunning detail, with more than 800 photographs of strange aircraft. Not the fuzzy, phony UFO photos the world is accustomed to, but clear daylight pictures of multiple flying disks and identifiable reference points in the foreground and background. The Meyer photographs were the best we'd ever seen in 40 years of record keeping. In fact, the quote we kept getting is they're too good to be true. Lee Elder says he wanted his face hidden because of some ongoing security work. He also says he was coaxed into investigating the Meyer case by retired Air Force Colonel Wendell Stevens. Elder, Stevens, and others spent five years chasing after Billy Meyer's beam ships. The evidence included the photos, of course, but also film footage and sound recordings. More than 40 eyewitnesses who substantiated Meyer's claims, small pieces of strange metal, and reputed landing sites with the same swirling impressions that 10 years later would be associated with UFOs in England and other countries. Instead of turning to UFO researchers, Elders and Stevens went to independent experts for their analysis. An IBM chemist concluded the strange metal was produced in a cold fusion process, a technology that only now is in its infancy on Earth. Hollywood special effects artists said the photos and film footage would be extremely difficult to fake, and computer analysis of the photos by NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and two universities found no evidence of a hoax. The bottom line, outside experts independently decided the Meyer material is legitimate. I am personally 98% convinced that Meyer did have visitations. 2% uh, I reserve. Uh, because uh, it didn't happen to me. However, the UFO community, angry at being excluded from the investigation, declared Meyer a hoax. Unsubstantiated stories were circulated that the Meyer photos were of models suspended from a fishing pole. Number one, what's his motive? It's not ego, it's not money. Number two, how could he do it on the resources he had? $500 equivalent of Swiss francs per month. I don't think one man could hoax this case. I don't think a team of men could hoax it. How do you get 40 people to agree to a hoax over a period of time up to 8, 10 years? The Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, also considers the Meyer case to be a hoax, mainly because Meyer would not cooperate with MUFON's attempted investigation. UFO hoaxes do happen. People build backyard saucers or take snapshots of flying hubcaps, but fakes are rare. Even the Air Force Project Blue Book found few phonies. The number of hoaxes was fewer than 5%. The number of unknowns were more than 20%. The number of uh, psychological aberrations, beautiful way to say crackpot cases, was 2%. The hoaxers may get more press than they deserve because there are a lot of lazy media people around. It's more than lazy media, though. The Meyer case, for instance, illustrates ufology's most glaring weakness, the suspicion and jealousy that permeate the field. It sometimes seems as if everyone wants to be the only one who knows the true UFO story. UFO believers end up using the same tactics as UFO skeptics, ostracizing those whose ideas don't conform. Ask John Lear. His contention that ETs are evil is so far askew from mainstream UFO thinking that some MUFON members resigned during a recent symposium rather than even listen to Lear. Lear was accused of spreading government disinformation, the most serious insult that can be made in UFO circles. Ironically, one man who made that charge, author Bill Moore, admitted at that same symposium that he had been duped into disseminating false data planted by the government. 
would the government really go to such lengths to discredit UFO researchers? It has and it does. Some examples. The first man to make a modern sighting, Kenneth Arnold, was investigated by the FBI, CIA, and IRS. They thought he must be some sort of commie spy to make such a report. Later on, CIA experts devised a systematic program of spying on UFO organizations. In one case, a UFO club was not only infiltrated by the CIA, but CIA agents were elected as its officers. CIA scientists pondering how to make UFO witnesses keep quiet talked about getting Walt Disney to produce cartoons that ridiculed UFO sightings. They also planned to get broadcaster Arthur Godfrey involved at one point, and most recently, a former Air Force officer with a long history of spreading false UFO information appeared with his face hidden on a national UFO broadcast to explain that the U.S. has alien beings in its custody and that they love to eat strawberry ice cream. To some, all of this has the makings of a government conspiracy. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, the government's been lying to the public for 42 years. It's very, very difficult to go back and say, we've been, admit that we've been lying to you. 42 years is a long time for the government to keep anything a secret, let alone something as sensational as UFOs. UFO researchers couldn't agree more. They say there have been huge cracks in the cover-up, but that the public and press haven't been listening. At the center of this whole scenario is the conservative New Mexico town, Roswell, which in 1947 was home to the Roswell Army Air Base. These days the locals use these old airstrips to race dragsters and the old hangars as an industrial park. But 42 years ago, this is where it all began, the birthplace of what some have called the Cosmic Watergate. What happened on that night in July 1947 sounds like the plot of an old science fiction movie. Residents saw a bright object streak across the sky. 70 miles out of town, it exploded, scattering debris over a large area. Rancher Mac Brazel found the strange metallic fragments and days later reported the matter to authorities. Roswell intelligence officer Major Jesse Marcel was dispatched to the scene to collect the wreckage. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all our activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. Marcel said the thin foil-like metal was virtually indestructible with strange hieroglyphics written on it. In his words, it was not of this earth. Base commander Colonel William Blanchard, certainly familiar with all aircraft of the day, agreed. He called up his press liaison, Lieutenant Walter Hott. He called and said words to this effect. We've got pieces of what we think is a flying saucer. Hot wrote and released a story that was immediately picked up by newspapers and wire services, spurring phone calls from all over the world. Major Marcel was told to load the wreckage into a B-29 and fly it to Wright Field in Ohio. He landed first at 8th Air Force Headquarters in Fort Worth, where General Roger Ramey took control of the debris ordered Marcel and others to keep quiet, and issued another news release saying the debris was actually from a crashed weather balloon. As he and Marcel posed for reporters with debris from a balloon, the real wreckage, according to witnesses, was flown under armed guard to Ohio. The newsmen saw very little of that material, a very small portion of it. And none of the important things, like these uh, members that had these hieroglyphics or, or markings on. And when the general came in, he told me not to say anything, that he would handle it. The story held for 30 years until Stan Friedman and his colleagues started digging. They found more than 100 witnesses with first or second-hand knowledge of the Roswell incident. They also believed that the debris was from an alien spacecraft that crashed miles beyond the Brazel Ranch. Numerous witnesses say they saw the crashed disk, the bodies of dead aliens inside. But the military seized the evidence and swore them to secrecy. Walter Hott says flat out the story of the weather balloon was a cover-up. So does Bob Shirky. Shirky was the officer who ordered up the B-29 that transported the strange debris. He saw the wreckage and thinks if it really was from a weather balloon, it wouldn't have been flown to Ohio in such a hurry. Shirky also has knowledge of the alien bodies. The information is from a close friend who ran the town funeral parlor in the 40s. It has never been made public until now. Did you see the sketches in the paper of the humanoids or the bodies? And I said, yes. He says, well... I can tell you that's what they look like. So that, uh, our funeral parlor supplied the caskets for the Air Force to use because we had the contract. And they came in and took all the 
baby-sized or youth-sized caskets we had. What would an alien spacecraft be doing in Roswell in the first place? Well, in the late 40s and early 50s, New Mexico had more UFO sightings than any other place in the world. Consider one possible explanation. It was at Los Alamos that the atomic bomb was developed and built. The Trinity site is where the first A-bomb was detonated. White Sands is where all post-war missile tests were conducted. And Roswell was home to the 509th, the only atomic bomb wing in the world. If an alien intelligence wanted to learn about human military capabilities, New Mexico was the place to be. The strange sightings and somewhat flimsy excuses continued long after the alleged Roswell crash. Lonnie James was an Air Force radar operator in Roswell in the 50s. He recalls at least three instances when UFOs were picked up on radar and seen from the ground. Jets were scrambled, but they couldn't get close. The sweep on the radar comes around every five seconds. The rate of speed was so great, we could not, it disappeared off the radar before we could get a uh, so check the speed on them. How fast is that? Uh, well, it was well over 2,000, well over. The official explanation for what James and others saw, the ubiquitous excuse, weather balloons. I think you know as well as I do, George, that weather balloons do not behave in that fashion. Of course, UFO buffs smell a cover-up. But what about the level-headed people of Roswell? Do they believe that a flying saucer crashed outside their town? I don't know percentage-wise uh, what the, the difference would be, but I think after the recent exposure, I think that really a lot of people believe it. An odd footnote to the story, in September, the Roswell incident was featured on the NBC program Unsolved Mysteries. Within days of that broadcast, the people of Roswell started seeing weather balloons. During our interview with Walter Hott, a weather balloon floated over his backyard. Another was spotted on the drive from Roswell to Albuquerque. Is there a vital need for weather data in the New Mexican desert, or is someone trying to prove something? Former U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater thinks there's something fishy about the whole story. As chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and an Air Force general, Goldwater had a top-secret security clearance. During a visit to Wright-Patterson Air Base in Ohio, he asked to view the hangar where the Roswell wreckage and other UFO information were reportedly stored. Permission was denied. Goldwater later wrote that he was told the matter was classified above top secret. He was also told to never ask again. What does the government know that it isn't telling us? Tomorrow, we'll delve into the government's own files to find out if the cover-up is real and ongoing. And later, we'll reveal the identity of this man who says the government is flying alien craft in the Nevada desert. It's uh, not only a crime against the American people, it's a crime against the scientific community. Speculation about some long-standing government cover-up is tough for many people to swallow. Tomorrow, as we mentioned, we'll look at files obtained through the Freedom of Information Act to see if there's a real basis for the cover-up cover up allegations. Back to the first part of the story, Billy Meyer, the one-armed farmer. What happened to him? Uh, he's still alive, living on his farm in Switzerland, but we understand from Lee Elders that things have changed considerably for him, that uh, he's real despondent these days, and the, these visits from the Pleiadian cosmonauts, if they ever happened, have stopped. What do UFL critics say about the Roswell incident? Well, Phil Klass, for example, of course, who, who buys none of this stuff, he basically says that all of the witnesses involved are lying. Either they're lying or they're hoaxers. Of course, uh, it's also been proven that uh, of the over 100 people with first or second-hand degree knowledge of the Roswell incident, not one has been interviewed by Phil Klass. Hmm, interesting. Thank you, George. See you tomorrow night.